Okay, the time is here. Thank you for coming to the class. There may be another one or two uh, need to slip in. If so, uh, we'll put them right up here. That'd be the penalty for it. <laughs> we saw where all the early people sat in the back row. A lot of Baptists here, back row Baptists. You got that done. Uh, but anyway, thanks for coming to the class. Uh, very excited about this, uh, entering into a six, seven week journey. Before I forget it, we will not be meeting July 4th weekend. So if I tell you we're gonna be gone, good. I'm gonna be gone too. No, I'm gonna be here, but I won't be here uh, doing the class. So it is six weeks long class uh, starting today and uh, we'll take care of some details, uh, logistics up in front here. And one is restrooms, women, you can go directly back in there. Uh, but the men after ground, take a left, take a left, take a left. It's right behind the back row over there. So if you need to use that, uh, the class is somewhat informal. So you can, uh, if you need to go and get some more coffee in the middle of it, uh, uh, doesn't offend me. Uh, just as long as you don't all leave at the same time. <laughs> that would be kind of discouraging. Uh, so... Who is Don Reed? I know a few of you in here, but most of you I do not know. One, I am a volunteer, though I wear one of these tags. I stole it from somebody. <laughs> no, I'm a volunteer here, and I've been doing this class for 11, 12 years now. And uh, it's on finance, and it's on uh, church, and it's on Bible, and it's on God, and it's on us. And whenever I start this class, I always say I'm very thankful uh, to be able to teach this class in a church where they're not in financial stress. I mean, that really takes the pressure off, right? So I want to say right up front, this is not a fundraising class. You are not on the elders hit list because you signed up. <laughs> we have your address. You will not get a visit from a pastor or an elder. This is about what God says in his word to all of us. And uh, the, the slogan, the branding, the mantra for this uh, course will come up on a slide here in a minute. But I just want you to relax and uh, enjoy it. You know, there's a stigma around uh, going to a finance class. It's unfortunate and it's largely untrue. Well, if those people sign up for a finance class, they must be in trouble. Actually, the statistic is just the opposite. Uh, if uh, it's more likely that people come who are very interested in finance, want to know a little bit more, maybe uh, hope to find out one more thing that they can put in their financial toolbox. So uh, relax about that, too. There's nobody taking pictures of who's in here and say those people are really in trouble, I'm sure. Probably will have an old car next week uh, for the new one there in place of the new one. So uh, why do I teach this class or what authority do I have to teach this class? I had a lunch about uh, 11, 12 years ago at Wooden Spoon and we live over in that area, uh, Gentry, and there was a couple of businessmen and one of the pastors from here and uh, we we're talking about doing a finance thing here. And uh, uh, one of the corporate people said in a very nice and diplomatic way, because he was a professional, but basically what he was saying is, what right do you have to teach this class? And that's a question. But later, you know, really, it's, it's really an incredible story. I have a pastoral background, spent uh, four or five decades doing that in church ministry, pastoring, church planning, etc. cetera. Uh, but then in 2005, I was exposed to something called the generosity movement. Uh, I was working with uh, pastors out in California at that time, and a uh, hundred of us from across the United States, the family of churches I was a part of, went to Atlanta for three days, and it was an immersion course in how to lead your church into generosity. And really, that changed my uh, my view of God, the Bible, what he says about money, et cetera. And, uh, the, the things that we're going to discuss over the next uh, five, six weeks here, uh, from God's point of view, are not just theory or theology that I know, but actually it comes out of the practice of my wife and I as we uh, really ramped it up back in 2005 as we got more insight into what God has for us, wants to do for us, and how that can affect the kingdom and have eternal rewards. So that's kind of the whole class today. So if you want to go, go ahead, <laughs> but uh, we'll do it piece by piece. Uh, so I have, I've had the pleasure of doing this class here. I'm kind of in the generosity division of uh, 
of uh, fellowship. In fact, if you search for that word, you might even end up on a little place on the website where there's some generosity material uh, there along the way. Now, all of you should have gotten a book on the way in, and here's how the course works. Uh, I will be showing slides up here, and there'll be some blanks to fill in. Uh, that's to keep you awake during class, okay? <laughs> but more so to take it home. In fact, the uh, pedagogical, the learning uh, component says, if we just see something versus hearing it, just hearing it, uh, we remember 50% more than we would have. If we see it, hear it, see it, and write it down, it goes up to like 75%. So this is not just because we want to keep you busy, but it's actually on the retention side of things. Now, there are the five classes in here. I'll talk about class six in a moment. But when you get to the back, it's called appendices. Uh, now, we used to hand out a lot of materials in here, and more people were asking, can we get dig digitally, or can we get an MP4, or whatever. We've tried to move uh, to that in our new book. And so uh, every lesson has some other resources that I may or may not mention. I will mention one, hopefully, at the end of class today that we give out, because we can't have a course on generosity without being... Generous. Generous. <laughs> okay. So we'll help you build a little library and get exposed to more than we have time to uh, talk about here in uh, the class time. So any other questions that any of you have before we have a word of prayer and jump into the session? By the way, I want to introduce my lovely assistant over to your left. <laughs> left. Uh, this is my wife, Ray. We've journeyed together for uh, 58 years or more and uh, tried to practice uh, uh, what God has asked us to do with our stuff. And uh, we, get, we are an endorser. We're a champion of what God says to do. And she wanted to say... I didn't, but you could. <laughs> One of the resources we used to give out is a CD. Not many people have CD players anymore. So we've made it into a CD before, and it's on our website. But I will send you the link to it so you can just click it in the email. Yep. While we're sitting in here, you'll get, get an email. Some of you may look at it on your phone, but it's the uh, handout. And since we're talking about that, uh, we used to work in California with a family of churches, I said, and, and Ray, my wife, led a large women's retreat of a thousand or more people, women, uh, in Monterey at the higher Regency. And uh, I did some uh, support for her. And it was always, where do I go to church on Sunday? Not with a thousand women. <laughs> where would I go? And so I was really praying this one Sunday uh, of uh, where to go. And uh, Actually, the the hotel person that worked with you assigned you said, oh, you should try Shoreline Community Church. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So I found it, uh, went there, and the pastor, Kevin Harney, was in a seven-week series on setting the trajectories of your life. And he talked about spiritual. He talked about uh, family. He talked about uh, various things. But I was there on guess what week? setting the financial trajectory of your life. He says it's so much better than I could that that's the MP4 that you'll get an email link on and it's worth listening to. It was from a January presentation. You'll hear him make uh, references to uh, Christmas and going through the uh, checkout line and the clerk calls, oh, do you want to donate to the Christmas fund for, for whoever? And he goes, no. And then God really convicted him. He's really a funny guy to listen to. And what he did scared everybody in the store. So hopefully with that teaser, uh, you'll open that up and listen to it. Uh, but he has a great, a great uh, overview of setting your financial trajectory of your life so you end up where you want to be. Anything else, Ray? Thanks for your help. Okay, let me have a word of prayer, and we're going to start in the pursuing the joy of generosity. Father in heaven, thank you for fellowship. Thank you, God, for providing so bountifully for us in this world. And though it uh, has troubles and ripples on the water and challenges along the way, uh, you are not troubled by that. You know the end from the beginning, and you've let us know about that, too. And thank you for that uh, peace and security that you give us in the uh, midst of our journey. And may we be people uh, that spread peace uh, rather than trouble and be known for that. Thank you for letting us do that through Christ. Thank you for this class and just people who are eager to learn more about you and what you say about the things you give to us. So I would ask the Spirit to be our, our teacher. Help me to remember the things that are important for these people and uh, pass over some other things. And uh, God, we look forward to you uh, helping each one of us on the journey uh, as we spend this time talking about uh, your thoughts into our finances and possessions. In Christ's name, 
Amen. Amen. Okay, pursuing the joy of generosity, I uh, heard a preacher on the radio say this week, a lot of people say, uh, give till it hurts. He said, I don't think that's right. Give till it feels good and makes you happy, because God loves what kind of a giver? A cheerful, a cheerful giver. <laughs> so pursuing the joy of generosity is not till it hurts, it's till, it, till we really get great joy out of it, and that really is the message. Now, the values for this course, and if you heard me a few Sundays ago when we uh, did a little promo on this uh, class, I used this phrase uh, on the first slide, it's what we want for you, not what we want from you. Now, that is essentially what uh, the generosity movement is about. But unfortunately, most churches, and you know, expectedly so, most churches end up saying more about what we want from you than what we want for you. We want a new youth pastor. We want a new church bus. We want a new building. We want a new this. We want to do this. We want to send kids to camp or send short team. In. And can you help us? But actually, that's only a small part of the message of what God says about the things that have been given to us. His emphasis is on, his emphases are on what he has for us, not from us. Now, if you think about that, you say, well, Don Reed, if you're such a believer in that, why do you go to church to pass the offering plate if you went to the nine o'clock service? <laughs> and that's another discussion we don't have time for, but it's a valid question. You know, if God, as we'll see in a moment, owns it all, and it just wants for us, but actually, uh, it's a balance in that. And we'll try to unpack that uh, along the way. What we want for you, not what we, what we want from you. That is the basic biblical message of the finances and possessions that God has given to us. Well, how do we begin to change our thinking? Romans 12, 2. By the way, how many of you have you version on your phone? Okay, I think it was a, not 20, I think it was 2020. This verse was searched more times on U version, like 2.5 million times people looked up Romans 12 too. Isn't that incredible? You know, out of all the verses in the Bible. Well, it's a pivotal verse. And uh, some of you could uh, probably uh, recite it to me, but let me read it in this New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. So let's get our you know, finance hat on now. Don't do it like the world does. How is the world doing it? Talk to me. That's all you had to say. <laughs> okay, we just went from 10, mil 10 trillion to 31 trillion in debt on the nation. Okay? Uh, I sat by the recycling place yesterday to drop off an old microwave. They said, oh, you, that'll be so many dollars for you to leave it here. And I go, what? I thought this was community recycling. Oh, no, no, the county cut our funds. Any county people here, sorry. But the county <laughs> cut our funds. Now we're, you're going to have to pay for it. I mean, you go from the top to the bottom, the simplest things, and it's out of kilter. And I think well, inflation, highest rate in 40 years. Etc. So this is good advice. Don't do it like the world. Everybody got that? That's a starting point. Don't copy the way the world does, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. How do we change the way we think? We start thinking the way God does. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. And then the promise in the end of this verse is incredible. It should be enough to, you know, invite all of us into that journey of generosity. He says, if you will do it God's way, here's what you're going to find. It's going to be good, not hard, or the bigger word is onerous on it, not distasteful. It's going to be good. It's going to be pleasant. Is that the word here? Pleasing in this translation, pleasant in sums. In fact, it uh, answers perfectly. But the, the word really is teleos uh, for the people here uh, they, they know the Greek uh, it is teleos which means and teleological means the end times formation if already made for you uh, if you want to as a young man who used to go here I see him running out on the roads outside of Gentry in the winter snow sleet and there he is running I go Joe what are you doing he said, I want to run a half marathon in Little Rock in the end of March. I go, okay, well, I just thought you were crazy. <laughs> but you do have something you're trying to go for. He goes, yeah. Guess what happened? That weekend in March, it snowed in Little Rock, and they, they had no half marathon. But he was, he was fixed on it because of what the promise was out there. 
His values were in place, and snow and sleet uh, didn't uh, stop him along the way. As I was thinking about this, though, the, probably the great, a great, maybe the greatest illustration is Jesus, who came down, he had his values in place. You could pick a number of verses. I came to do the will of him that sent me. That would be a good one. Uh, he's got his focus. Or I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for money. Many verses talk about his focus. So remember, before he went into ministry, he was taken out into the desert to what? What's it called? The temptation. The devil said, I'm going to check you out. How, how fixated you are on those values. And he went down the three values, the three kinds of sin that we get into. If our values are in place, we will do the right thing 99% of the time. Like my wife and I, as I said, have been married 50-some years. Divorce is not a word that we've ever used in our, in our uh, relationship. Is our values are in place. We are there till death do us part. How many of you know what TED Talks are? <laughs> Use them at work. Some, you have 20-minute little snippets that are you know, just a profound kind of thing. This one comes from TED uh, from, uh, not Ted, uh, Sinek. What's this? Steve, is Steve? Simon. 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 Yeah, Simon. The TED Talk got me messed up. Simon Sinek, 2008, is sometimes called the Golden Circle. And it talks about how we make decisions and intuitively start from the outside. What do I need to do? I want to run a race, or I want to lose weight, or I want to buy a new car. How do I do it? Well, you do whatever that, and then we finally after, and maybe sometimes it's called buyer's regret, you go, why did I buy a new car, <laughs> or why am I doing this? Sinek turned that around and said, you start from the inside out and, this, and answer the question why first. A lot of what we're going to be talking about, and we'll end up with a few slides that say, why would we want to be generous? Because if we get our why right, then we will figure out the how and the what to do. That will come because we have some motivations very deep within our soul. That's why this has been listened a few million, or watched a few million times at uh, Simon Sinek's talk. There are four major points that we're gonna talk about today. And the first one is God owns it all. Now that may be a depressing thought as I unpack that <clears throat> because we, we are in our society, we are people who own a lot of stuff, quote unquote, but uh, that in fact isn't what the Bible says. This prayer comes from uh, David after they have taken the great offering what, for what became Solomon's temple, oversubscribed it, and here was a part of the prayer. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the majesty, and the splendor for how much is yours? Everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. And that's really where we begin with a biblical view of what possessions uh, God has given to us. Uh, God actually unpacks it, and he says, I own the land. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. How many of you know what a sabbatic, uh, what the Sabbath or sabbatical, what is that? How many years? Seven. Okay. How many of you know what a jubilee year is? <laughs> How many? Seven sevens. Okay. And you remember what happened in the Old Testament, Jubilee year, Israelites into the land, promised land, and they're divided up by tribes. But sometimes over that 50 years, you got in trouble and you had to either let somebody, you get a mortgage on it, you get a debt on it, or you just something, it, you know, somebody else owns your land. Every 50th year, it goes back to the original owner. So the payment for land would be how many years till the Jubilee year of 50 years? Okay. Why was that happening? Because God says, I own the whole land, the whole globe, but in this case, he was talking about uh, Israel, the promised land, and I gave it to that tribe or to that family. So in Jubilee year, it would all go back uh, because it is God's land. We only use it for a little while. Our first church that we went to out of uh, Dallas Seminary, we went to uh, South Dakota. Anybody here from South Dakota? No, there's not that many people in South Dakota. We would just about, you know, fill it end to end. Uh, uh, it's a great, uh, we, we were there 21 years and raised our kids there. There was a farmer out on the uh, uh, Iowa border, which is 13 miles east of Sioux Falls. 
where we live, uh, who is a farmer in our church, just a, just a wholesome family and guy. And it was not many years ago that uh, uh, somebody wanted to build a casino right on the border in Iowa because uh, there were none in South Dakota, I think, at the time. And so they came to my friend, Carl Palmberg, and said, hey, we want to buy your farm. We'll give you a million dollars cash for it. And Carl said, no, I am just using this land for the next person. It is farmland that God has given to me, and I will not do that. Wow, he's a hero in my mind. You know, he could have cashed out and moved to wherever he wanted to. Uh, but he understood that God was... God had given him that land. Any of you know uh, contour farming? I grew up on a farm, but it's where you, you till your land and contour it so that it doesn't erode and all the good soil go down the hill. And he spent thousands of dollars doing that to his farm. And I remember he told me, this was 50 years ago, he said, Don, uh, somebody else will be doing this farming here, and I, just, I, I want to be a good steward before God. I mean, that's good thinking, understanding who's, whose land that was and not, uh, letting it go for some other purpose. Uh, the money, you say, what do you mean God owns it all? I got my paycheck on Friday, or probably electronically now, automatically deposited. But whose name was on the paycheck? Say the word. Mine. <laughs> right? What do you mean God owns it all? Well, ask God. Haggai I two eight. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. That's a that's all cash, you know, way back then and now somewhat, declares the Lord Almighty. More so. Uh, you might say, well, listen, it is mine because I went to school, I got good grades, I got a good job as an engineer, or nurse, or teacher, or whatever it is, and uh, I do that. It's hard work. Do you know what it is to work 60 hours a week, wherever, wherever? Well, First Chronicles 29 in that same passage of the prayer, uh, David says, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to give somebody a promotion. <laughs> okay, but so we, we want to be careful about, you know, taking too much credit for what really is a gift from God. All of us know people somewhere in our circle of acquaintance that uh, uh, will never be able to work. It could be mental, it could be physical, it could be, you know, something happened to them, whatever. But it's a gift. And I don't know about you, but I get up every day and thank God for life and health and strength and dreams that I have mm -hmm. as God will allow me to be here. Because that is not an assumption to take lightly. Uh, that, uh, that well, you know, it's me, I did it, I, I, it's my paycheck, etc. You may say to yourself, uh, my power and the strength in my hands have produced this wealth for me. It's in Deuteronomy where they're getting the law for the second time. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. One an opportunity and where we live, but then education maybe, or skill, or some connection to get the job that you have. It all comes from God. Even the animals, I love this in Psalm 50, where God says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens. Every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. You may know that chorus from way back. I know every bird in the mountains, the insects in the fields are mine. All the way from the big to the little. It's all mine. Are we getting the picture? Who owns it all? God. Yeah. Okay, that was four of you. We're going to work on that <laughs> number a little bit. Uh, this came, comes out of something, as the footnote says, uh, it's from the National Christian Foundation, uh, which we may talk about sometime in a future class, but uh, helping business owners uh, handle their finances uh, to the glory of God. Many of us know that God is the owner of all things, but it can be difficult when it comes to living as if it were true. Yeah, in a country built on individualism and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, it's sure easy to feel like our money is our own. We like to think of our generosity as giving from our own wealth. But the truth is that every dollar that passes through our hands belongs to God and always will. We're more like managers over whatever portion God gives us to manage. Like any manager, we require we would require a fee to cover our own living expenses and keep food on the table. And that fee is our lifestyle finish line. But when God gives us more to manage, we must consider his intentions, not our own. When it really sinks in that everything belongs to God, it changes everything. And I say amen to that. You know, that really gets us going in the right direction. Not thinking like the world, but thinking like God does. Therefore, every spending decision is, uh, spending financial decision is a spiritual one. 
if you borrow uh, a car from somebody, what condition do you want to take it back in? Better. Better than it was, right? You get it washed or you, you know, detailed or whatever you do. You don't take it back trash. And we are merely custodians, managers, stewards of what God has given to us. And uh, we will one day answer for that. We'll talk about that more uh, on another day. But it becomes a spiritual decision, not just can we afford it, but in fact inviting God into the uh, conversation is the direction we're going. It will also influence how we care for God, for our God's possession. I give you the illustration of the farmer, etc. This demands a major shift in our thinking when we begin to see our material possessions as God sees them. Uh, I was mentored by a guy out in North County, San Diego, and he made a statement one day that I, took me a while to get my head around. But uh, he said, ownership is a curse. Why, why would he say ownership is a curse? Anybody unpack that a little? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Steward, not owner, yes. But everything we have... It takes care, right? <laughs> you know, you got to take care of it. So actually stepping back from the owner to the manager uh, position is a much more relaxing. How many older people want to retire and get into a home where they don't have to do what? Take care of the lawn or if you up north to the snow. You know? <laughs> I mean, we know that intuitively, but it's, well, ownership, I want to I own my car, not have a uh, loan on it, or my house, I want to own it. No, actually, ownership is kind of a curse. I finally got that into my thinking a little bit. How do we change our thinking? Meditate on the First Chronicles 29, 11, and 12. Uh, beware of the Lord's, Lord's ownership of all you have. Be careful using my, mine, and ours. Now, caution here. I'm not saying you have to go out and get a vanity plate and has God's car on it. You know, mm -hmm. relax. You know, but be careful just in attitude. You know, of what if somebody wanted to borrow that car? You know, uh, there was a young man. We did a church plan up in South Dakota, and there was a young man who, uh, in New York, in our family of churches, it, we were networked across the U.S. Uh, he wrote and said, hey, I just got out of high school and uh, I'm a carp carpenter, you know, I've done that some. Can I come and help you? Because we we're going to rehab their first building and so forth. So he came out and lived with us for a number of months and didn't have a car. Uh, and he said, you know, I need to go back and visit my mom. Something was happening. I don't know the detail. And I said, well, Doug, just take my car. Now, here he's probably 17 years old. And I said, we, and we said, you, that's your good car. Well, Yeah. <laughs> I won't send you with the old car. I won't make it. Uh, but it's how we think about it. You know, is it God's house, or is it your or, or our house? You know, and hopefully all of us have some stories about when we invited people over, or we gave a room to somebody along the way. Be careful about this possessive mentality that permeates our country. Begin to consider God's choices for his things in your possession. If we are stewards, if we are managers, if we are custodians, then we ask the owner uh, in the conversation, what does he want done for that? Now, what I have done so far is uh, probably put you in a minor state of depression or maybe measure. <laughs> you thought you just got your house paid off, your car paid off, and it's finally mine but I took that away from you. <laughs> it's not your paycheck, it's not your house, it's not your this, that, that. Well, uh, here we turn the corner and a little more encouragement is coming along because the owner is a very generous person. The owner, and we'll come to the verse where it says he loves to give gifts to his children along the way. Uh, in fact, this verse, the first part of Matthew 7 and 11, it comes out of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doing this long sermon, and the uh, earlier part of this verse says, if, if, you, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, then how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Okay? That's the kind of generosity mindset. Or there are a couple words out there, and we all have to reflect on these. Are we in a scarcity, a scarcity mindset about things, or are we in an abundance mindset? Uh, and that's two ways of looking at life. Sometimes it's, are you a half cup full or a half, <laughs> half cup empty person? It's that same kind of, do you see that, oh, we hardly have any more? No, you know, we're fine. 
And God is in the more than half cup. It's a cup running over. Uh, he loves to give good gifts. Now, caveat, do not leave this room and say that guy, whoever he was, did health, wealth, and prosperity teaching on Sunday morning. This is not what we're talking about. It will be a biblical message, but there is a principle in there. When we'll go over a verse on it. It says, he who can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. If you've had kids who finally learned to drive and they wanted to take the car, uh, if they come back and it's all in one piece, then you, you, know, you trust them for the next time, right? You might say you could take it to the ball game out of town. Okay? It's no different with God. He gives us stuff. He owns it all. He says, hey, why don't you use it? Use it well, and I'll trust you with more. And that is not uh, health, wealth, and prosperity teaching. In fact, we'll put something up about it before we get through. The columns, do you have the columns in your book? I sometimes, yes? Okay. These are just a record of God's generosity from big to little. Uh, Garden of Eden. What comes to mind when you think of a word or two to describe the Garden of Eden? Paradise. <laughs> Paradise. Didn't even need clothes, perfect temperature, no bugs, no chiggers, no ticks. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was over the top. And the fruit's already there and the vegetables in the garden and so forth. Uh, Abraham. How, now, that's the guy that he looked, God looked over all the earth after the flood and so forth and find one family or one man who would be the start of a righteous people. Call it Israelis today. The roots were Abraham. And... Uh, Abraham said, sure, God, you know, and he already had a heart toward God. And when he was asked to move and head out toward the promised land, it was like moving a small city with the herds and the flocks and the in-laws and the outlaws and the servants and the camels and the sheep and so forth. It was a small city because he may have been one of the richest men in the world because God does live to give, love to give things to people who will handle it well. The promised land uh, do you remember any of the words that describe going into the promised land of what they were going to find when they got there? <laughs> that, that's always what we get. Milk and honey. That is true. But there are more words, and here are some of them. You will live in fortified cities you did not build. You will pick from vineyards you did not plant. You will eat from silos of grain that you did not fill. You will drink water from wells that you did not dig, and on it goes. Because our God is a generous God. He has an, uh, has an enviable record of being generous. Solomon, uh, there are three kings at the beginning of the United Kingdom, Saul, David, Solomon, SDS, and they all reigned 40 years. Uh, so it went from uh, Saul to David to Solomon. Solomon, in a prayer in Second Chronicles 1, uh, only asked God for one thing, as a king following the greatest king that Israel ever had, what did he ask for? He asked for wisdom. But what did God give him as the story plays out? Wisdom and richest man in the world. God is a generous God and loves to give good gifts to his children. <clears throat> Job, we, somebody said Americans like to read the first part of Job and then skip about 34 chapters and go to the end because <laughs> it's so dismal and depressing, right? Oh, oh yeah, blame you, this, that, 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 yeah. And we like to hear the end where it says, uh, after everything was taken away, his, his uh, farms and his flocks and his family and everything, then God brings it all back. Uh, again, and it says he lived to see his grandchildren. So that took, you know, 30, 40 years that he lived. And uh, it says that he was given fourfold over what he had lost. Wow, that's a pretty generous owner, <laughs> you know, because Job didn't fold under the test, you know, because remember Satan's temptation or Satan's uh, taunt to, to uh, God. The only reason Job is such a righteous man, you gave him so much. Take his stuff away and he'll crumble. And Job said to his wife, even, who wanted, said, why don't you just curse God and die? And Job said, what? Anybody remember? Remember? Though he kill me, yet I will trust in him. He had his values in place, going back to a previous point. Uh, we've talked about all the rich people, but I wanted to put a poor person. <laughs> the widow of Zarephath was at 1 Kings 17, I think, uh, where Elijah says uh, to the widow, uh, bake me a cake. And uh, she said, all I have is enough flour and enough oil 
for one meal for my son and I, and then we die. Wow, that's pretty depressing. And he said, bake me a cake. <laughs> and so she, being obedient to God's prophet, baked a cake. And what did God do for her? Lifetime supply. Obedience. He who can be trusted with little, she who can be trusted with little, can be trusted by much. It's a consistent message throughout Scripture for people with a lot, people with smaller amounts. But I put a couple of things in yellow. You won't say that on your book, but on the screen. But in fact, the most generous thing was to give us Jesus, who Paul says is the indescribable gift. And it's a part of why we're here in fellowship and what we preach and so forth. And the gift of eternal life. There is no measure for that. The generosity of God to take us in who, when we were mad at him, when we were against him. Not after we loved him and they said, oh, yeah, okay. No, no, no. When we were enemies of God is what the scripture says. Uh, God reached down and redeemed us. Unbelievable. Somebody put it in this little uh, trilogy. The father gave the son the most valuable gift a parent could give. The son gave his life the most valuable gift a person could give. And God gives us eternal life, the most valuable gift we could ever receive. Is that in your book? Mm -hmm. I hope so, yeah. This is a new book that we've just uh, gotten out, by the way, and I uh, uh, hope you're enjoying it along the way. Number, C, or number three, in C, God loves to share with his children. So we have a God who owns it all. Well, what about me, God? Oh, I'll, I'll be generous. Uh, in fact, he loves to share with his children. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17 is, uh, 17, 18, 19 is a, a key passage uh, on generosity, and it starts out with these sobering words. Command those who are rich in this present world. Uh, by the way, I used this verse in sharing a message with Mickey a year ago. I don't know if any of you remember that. We talked about, uh, you know, we all like to think I'm not rich because I'm not the president of, Tyson or, you know, Microsoft or something. But that comparison is the wrong way to go. And the scripture is right here. Those who, are, those who are rich in this present world, of the whole world, where are we in the rich scale? And if you look that up on a percentile, we, by virtue of the fact that we had a car to come here today, that puts us in the top two percentile of wealth in the world. That's why it says those who are rich in this world. And that's us, folks. You know, if we get three meals a day, uh, or uh, 2005, 2010, took adult teams into Haiti, and uh, third poorest country in the world, living on a dollar a day uh, for a family. And I had a, a young man there who spoke four languages as a sophomore in high school in a Christian K-12 through school that we were helping, a, a church and a school. And one day I said to Manu, his name was Emmanuel Profite, I said, Manu, uh, I knew that his mother had abandoned him. He was staying with either uncle or grandfather, but it, he was widowed. And I said, Manu, do you eat like three meals a day or what? And he said, okay, here's, here's the deal. I get up in the morning and I go look in the cupboard to see if there's any rice. Uh, and if there is some, I'll fix a little bowl of rice and that's my meal for the day. Uh, and he said, if I it don't find any there, I go to my uncle, whoever it was, and I say, uncle, can you give me some money to go to the market? Because they have a fresh market. They got rice out on a tarp, you know, a blue tarp. Uh, and just buy a, buy a cup full of it. And I ask money. If he's asked for money, he says, if, if he doesn't have any money, then I don't eat that day. Uh, so that's that's the real world, you know. The, not the way we're going to go to, some of us go out to lunch, and there are 47 things that we can <laughs> choose from on the menu. I mean, it's got to be America, right? I, I know there are other places, but we are rich in the present world. Not to be arrogant, put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Okay, we're back to the generous God, who loves to give good things to his children. Because he's, he's so generous it's just in his attitude toward his creation. However, let's not misunderstand this verse, uh, as, as we, you know, or some people might. Everything for our enjoyment? Well, how about methamphetamine? We need to have some discretion and discernment. God gives us good things 
for our enjoyment. And there are bad things out there, as we all know. In fact, Paul said, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Now, in the worldly language, we would call that common sense, right? <laughs> Just don't do that. Uh, in the spiritual sense, there's another phrase, and you might want to jot it down, sanctified wisdom. Because we have minds and because we are connected to the God of all truth and gives us good, good directions from his word, we can end up with decisions that are made with sanctified wisdom along the way. What is constructive? What is beneficial for me? God loves to give us those good things. Uh, in Acts 17, uh, Paul writes, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So where does everything come from? Yeah, he owns it. He shares it. We enjoy it. We use it while we're here. We're gone. <laughs> That's a, a worldview. Okay, a short worldview. So where's the why in all of this? Uh, and this is point four. God invites us into a journey of generosity to others around us. And I want to spend some time uh, just talking about that. Because hopefully you would agree that God is a generous God and there are more illustrations than we had time to give this morning. But that's only part of the story, just him being generous and providing for us generously. He has a purpose behind all of that. Going on in that same passage for Timothy 6, command them, those of us who are rich in this present world, all of us included here and way beyond, uh, to command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, and to be willing to share. Uh, I don't think it ha I have it on these slides, but there is a verse. Uh, Ephesians 4.28 is what I call the verse that says we, God never intended a, us to spend our whole paycheck. You know, what? <laughs> There's a verse like that? Yeah, there is. And I'll just give you a clue, and it's, not about, it's in the context of stealing and so forth. But he says at the end of that verse, so that you might have something to share with others in need. So if we spend to the limit and beyond, we'll talk about that when we get to credit and credit cards and mortgages. But if we spend to the limit and beyond, uh, we, we are probably not filling out what God asked us to do uh, because part of our paycheck was intended to help the poor around us along the way. So Paul says, be generous with our good deeds. And we all have opportunities to do that. You know, the ministry that, did you, did you know... Uh, See, a couple weeks ago now, there was a groundbreaking out here for Samaritan Center. To, you probably heard about that, right? I mean, there's a whole ministry devoted to that. And some of you may have volunteered in Our community group went and served breakfast one day up at the Rogers uh, facility and have, have been uh, down at Springdale some as well. But generous with our good deeds. You know, what are we known by? Just me, 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 and I spend all my time serving myself and my family and so forth. Well... Uh, generous with good deeds is the command. Generous with our finances. This is where it all also comes in. And that's going to be an ongoing part of our conversation in this class. Generous with our finances. Because if we say, well, he's talking about just, you know, uh, uh, just going over and raking the leaves for the neighbor or something. No, actually, there, you'll, we'll see this when we get to the giving lesson. Jesus talks more about finances than about heaven, hell, prayer. Uh, faith and some other things. Jesus talks more about it, so it must have been important uh, for us to get it straight along the way. The end of that prayer says, <clears throat> Who am I? Uh, this is David again, finishing out that prayer. Who am I? Who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Uh, because they've oversubscribed the offering for the temple. He said, Where did the people get all of that money? Now, we are the uh, part of the ongoing story of fellowship and multi-sites and campuses and Bentonville and Fayetteville. And if you go out in the wider world and talk to other people from other churches and what God has done here in this congregation over this decade that we're in the middle of, and Bentonville included, 
we could say, oh, Lloyd, who are these people that, we, that they should give so generously to have the Fenville campus paid off 18 months after it was occupied? Mm -hmm. That, I mean, if, if you're not aware of that, that is rare in church life. Try 18 years, <laughs> you know, or 25 years. But God has, given some, has put some very generous people in here, uh, and we're a part of that story. And then it's uh, underscored here. Everything comes from you. We've talked about that. And we've only given you, have given you only what comes from your hand. Now, that is a great promise if you don't get it the first time through. And here's the promise. God will never ask Don and Ray Reed to give something he hasn't already given to us. That makes sense? Uh, some couple gave the land for, I think, both Benville and Fayetteville. But uh, uh, if... If God would have come to Don and Ray Reed and said, can you give land for uh, for fellowship uh, for a Bentonville campus? God, I don't have land. <laughs> you know, there's a safety in that. You know, he will not say you're disobedient with something he hasn't already given to us along the way. So he is in this prayer, great offering for the temple. We've given you only what comes from your hand. God, you gave it first. And then you said, Will you give it to the temple? And they very joyously did that along the way. Another benefit for, gener for generosity, being generous, is laying up treasures for the coming age. Now again, let me read the verse, and, th and then I want to make a couple of comments about church life uh, with regard to this point. In this way, First uh, Timothy 6, where it says, "Be do good, rich in good deeds, be generous, be willing to share. In this way... They will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. What does that mean? Well, we may not know totally, but there actually is a little book out, which you, some of you know the name Bruce Wilkinson. Bruce Wilkinson spent three, I think it was three years or five, three years, five years studying this concept of what does it mean to lay up a firm foundation for the age to come? Does that mean a bigger mansion in heaven? Does that mean what? And he brought them all together, actually had, uh, had it reviewed by Multnomah Bible School staff, and went and spoke for a week, and they would, he'd speak in the morning, and they would, you know, <laughs> critique it in the afternoon, because he didn't want to be teaching not, uh, not what is truth uh, from the Bible. Uh, and it's a great resource. It's called A Life God Rewards would be worth reading because that's what we all want, a life that God rewards. And he did the homework for us. But it's on this topic of laying up a firm foundation for the coming age. What does that mean? And then secondly, take hold of life that is truly life. There are multiple instances in the Bible, as Wilkinson has tracked down, where it says what we do with our stuff here is going to make a difference in eternity. In fact, in the latter part of this book, he raises these two questions. He said, when we stand before God, we're going to be asked two questions. One is, what did you do with the gift of my son? And how we answer that will determine where we spend eternity. We all been going to Bible preaching churches long enough to understand that, right? We give the right answer. Come in. Give the wrong answer, separation from God for all eternity. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second question is this. First one, what did you do with the gift of my son? Second question is this. What did you do with the gift of the stuff I gave to you? Wow. Uh, we're going to watch a cute little video at the end. But uh, one of the messages in it is... God is watching, <laughs> okay, you know, what we're doing with our stuff. We don't think about that. We think it's mine, and I just, you know, go through life and spend it or whatever. But actually, it's, it's a bigger issue than that. Uh, and it has to do with what we do with our stuff. And Wilkinson says those two, those two questions are going to have to be answered when we stand before God. What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with the stuff I gave to you? Because God is watching. And then he and. In the end of it, he says <clears throat> uh, that they may take hold of life that is truly life. That kind of goes back to the what Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, a thing that is a sort of humorous to me. Uh, we all, many of us would know the name Warren Buffett, Omaha, Nebraska, the guru, stock guru. 
was about six years ago now, uh, he decided one morning to write a check for $36.2 billion to the second richest man, Bill Gates. Now, I don't know if you see any humor in that, but I go, why? why? There, there's some good reasons behind it. He didn't want to do the distribution of it and so forth. But if you read the articles after that, uh, here's what was more <laughs> pointed with regard to our conversation. Warren Buffett came to the place where he said, why, with all of the hard work I've done to become a multi-billionaire, does somebody else get the joy of giving it away after I die? Okay? <laughs> this is the last, last part of this phrase. Find life that is truly life. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And I don't think Warren Buffett, as far as I know, has any you know, significant connection to God. He wasn't talking about biblically. He just said, I want the joy of giving <laughs> because something happens when we give. Find life that is truly life. Jesus put it this oh, okay. Jesus put it this way. It may come down in another verse. He said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I am come to give you life and life what? <laughs> Abundantly. Okay, that's the same thing. Life that is truly life is about giving, not about consuming, keeping, hoarding, uh, greediness, etc. along the way. An interesting verse is Philippians 4.17. This is in the chapter where Paul says, I've had a lot, I've had a little. <laughs> I can do it, go either way. In fact, he says, uh, I've learned to be content in the state which I live, and that's what Ray and I talk about. Arkansas, we're happy. California, we were happy. South Dakota, we were happy. And be happy where, you know, God puts you. But he was talking. your gifts, Philippian church. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. That's a really curious phrase. Apparently, God, the perfect accountant, has an account with your name and my name and my wife's name and your spouse's name and everybody that's a part of the family of God. And that's where God is watching and he's putting in. We had the joy in California. There's a Hispanic family of five kids that were between houses, and they came to live in our three-bedroom house for three or four months. <laughs> that was a little crowded, uh, but we, they became like family to us. Wow. That was, I mean, we are connected, you know, over the years with this family. Yeah. Because doing good, being rich in good deeds, is really finding life that is truly life. And apparently God is keeping track of it, and God is keeping track of it. Taking hold of life is truly life, life abundantly, as I mentioned along the way. A good, pleasing, perfect, the same concept in Romans 12 too. Uh, you know, it's gonna be good, it's not gonna be hard. Generosity is not painful, uh, pleasing and perfect. But it will also break the hold that our treasures can have on us. And Ralph Dudera, has written a book called uh, The Wealth Conundrum. Well, uh, Ralph Dudera, as a late teenager, 20-something, his goal was to be a multimillionaire by age 40. He made it. Anybody want to know why? Well, it's too late for some of us. <laughs> but for you, <laughs> that, that could work. He figured out the fastest way for wealth <laughs> with his gifts and skills and so forth uh, was to sell life insurance policies to high net worth people. <laughs> so if the president of you know, Tyson or somewhere, uh, they take out a $5 million policy on the president so you know they have something to carry on or whatever, then, I mean, what's a any life insurance people in here? What would a commission be on a $5 million paid up policy? 50 grand. How much? 50 grand probably. Oh, at least, I think probably, you know, 100 grand, 150 grand or something, 5 million. Well, that's how he got rich. And he was a Christian. And he's 40 years old. And one day, Ralph Tadera said to God, I can make more money than I can ever spend. That's my conundrum. That's the mystery, God. What? Why? Why do you give me that gift? And then he discovered, really, how to use that excess for kingdom purposes and become a very generous person. But here's what he said. The acts in giving, and especially giving generously, is the best way to counteract our tendency to become the slave of money and what it will buy. And that's the accumulation route versus the distribution route. You hear me? And what does the world say? What's the bumper sticker on the back of the motorhome? Not the one I'm spending my kids' inheritance, but what's the other one that's on the back of the motorhome? He who dies with the most toys wins. wins. 
Somebody took a big black marker and changed it. He who dies with the most toys dies. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> okay. Break the hold of treasures can have on us. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said there are two ways to get enough. One is to continue to accumulate more, what we just talked about. The other is to desire less. Okay, there are two ways to be content. So, coming full circle. Uh, if you think about what we've talked about today, God is the owner in heaven, but he loves to share with his children so that we can be generous to others. And Jesus said, what happens in that being doing good, being rich in good deeds, being generous and willing to share uh, is the latter part of this verse. He says, do not, while you're on earth, lay up treasures for yourselves, moth and rust and thieves break in and steal, but lay up treasures for your, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, again, church teaching uh, often has said, and I believe erroneously so, that we can't have any attitude of benefit to us for, for anything we do for God. All the credit goes to God. We will lay down the crowns at his feet. And we've all heard that, right? Somewhere along the way. But unfortunately, that's what not, not the way Jesus said it here. Who do we lay up treasures for? What's the word in the verse? Ourselves. Ourselves. Whoa! That's a different perspective. Jesus said, if you will, with the stuff that God gives you, the God who is watching, if you will be generous and willing to share, do good deeds, etc., you will, in fact, lay up treasure for yourself. <laughs> That's why Paul said, I don't have to have anything more from you, Philippians, but I want you to have more credited to your account. God's words. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so... Oh, there's a word, for, there's a phrase for this, too. It's called enlightened self-interest. <laughs> ah, I got the picture. <laughs> you know, God is keeping track of, but it's a fact is for my benefit when we get to heaven in eternity. We'll unpack that, I think, next week when we talk about earning and working <laughs> and all of that. Uh, making kingdom investments that last forever, and this is in the... Uh, Matthew 6 passage as well investing in stuff that doesn't go away uh, if, there a com if there were a companion verse to Romans 12 2 it would be this and I, uh, you may want to jot it down we probably have it somewhere I don't remember where it is right now uh, 2 Corinthians 4 18 short verse and it says this do not fix your eyes on what is seen but on what is unseen for what is seen is temporal or temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Everybody got that? What are we taught to look at in the world? Which one, seen or unseen? Seen. Yeah, what do I drive? What do I wear? Where do I live? Where do I go on vacation? What do I put on Instagram, Facebook, you know, whatever? C, 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 C. And you know, Paul said, Spirit have said, do not fix your eyes on what is seen. It's temporary, but on what is unseen. Same thing Jesus saying, laying up treasures on earth that can't disappear along the way. I'm sorry, what was that first thing? <laughs> Second Corinthians 4.18. 418. Yeah. yeah, if I go too fast, interrupt me. That's fine. Uh, I did use an illustration when I spoke at Benville in their last outdoor service before the Christmas Eve service out in Orchard Park and yeah, use uh, part of this first, but illustration I used there, and I hope it makes sense to you. What if we found out that December 31, 2022, everything for exchange was going to be in cryptocurrency? What would we spend the next six months doing? Say it out loud. Buying crypto. Buying crypto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, buying NFTs or whatever <laughs> the other crazy stuff is that's going on. We would get our exchange into something that's going to spend after December 31. That's the offer Jesus is talking about. You can put it in stuff here. It's all going to burn. Or you can put it in eternal currency. And that will, that will result in benefit for you along the way. Uh, 
reflecting the generosity of God. Ooh, this got a little small on the sizing here. Uh, now, I, I love this verse. And again, it's about God trusting us. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that we can be what? Generous. Right. Reflecting the generosity of our God. If you want the full circle, it is God who owns, who is generous, gives to his people, that we can be generous and reflect the generosity of our God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We want to be more Christ-like. We want to be more godly. We want to be, you know, usually if you look at, uh, how can I become more like Christ? Well, read the Bible more, pray more, go to church faithfully. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'm wondering, that maybe the most godly thing we could do is give more. And that's not an appeal for anything. <laughs> it is enlightened self-interest. You know, you want to be godly? Be more like God. You'd be generous to the max. Why of generous living, faithful management, uh, brings eternal rewards. We've talked enough about that. Uh, generosity, live, generous living reflects the great generosity of our God. Now, the next slide is actually a video, but there's no sound on it, and I couldn't find the tech guy, and that's why Tanya, our admin, was up here trying to fiddle with the buttons. But there is no sound on it, but that's okay, because it's kind of a... Do you know what a mime is? You know, it's not totally a mime, but it was. There's not. There's not much speaking on it at all. What I'm going to do, I will give you the uh, narrative because I've seen it enough times to know, to know what it is. But here's where I'm going to get in trouble because one response is from two people, and it's about car one and car two. Uh, and one is in German and one is in Japanese, and I don't know what the Japanese is. I don't know. Well, Dankeschön is, what is that, German? I don't know. Okay, so let's watch this, and it's called God's Pie, and my apology for no sound along the way. There's music playing behind this normally. You can, you can see the rest of it. So each one of these people say thank you or whatever. Thanks for the house. The house. Hey. <laughs> no, thanks for enough time to be the house. Okay, here's Don Shane and Kamiyatsu or whatever he said for his German car and his uh, Japanese car. No. Okay. This guy just <laughs> goes bananas. <laughs> Pays on it. Okay, this guy said, okay, what about the interest? <laughs> okay, this was a really sad commentary. Education. <laughs> okay, so. Pi is gone. Paid all the bills for the month. Something like for him a little bit. says, I don't know if it's, dude, he brought the pie. Somebody said that. Yeah. 
So I was going to say, what did you hear in that? You didn't hear anything. Uh, what did you see in that? What's the message in that little clip? First piece in the beginning. Pardon? First piece in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else? If there isn't enough, um, make adjustments in other areas of life to make sure God gets. Yeah, we get all these obligations all along here. By the time we get down, hardly anything for us. But worse than that, there's not anything for what? Dude, he brought the pie. <laughs> no. Okay. What else did you see in there? What's the attitude of God? No force, right? Cut it up the way you want it. <laughs> Great attitude, smile, ah, you know, I'm here, I'm watching along the way. Anyway, cute little way to represent what we've been talking about this morning. God brings the pies, he has more pies, uh, and it's up to us how we divide up the pie. And uh, then eventually we'll get asked, you know, how'd you do with the pie? Yeah. How'd you do with the pie? So, so. Anything else you want to say, question, or comment along the way? Remember, you got an email, and that's the CD, CD of Kevin Harney, uh, Shoreline Christian Community Church, Shoreline Community Church in uh, Monterey, California. Uh, next week, we'll be back, take our next lesson. There's some people that were not able to be here today, and if that happens to you, uh, these are recorded and uh, will be posted probably in a couple days on the website uh, and probably will work best uh, uh, if you, well, there are a couple ways. You can call Tanya Newman here, but if you check with Ray on the way out and say, we're not going to be here this next week, then we'll make sure you get the link for that, uh, the recording of next week's, okay? If you just want to listen to this one again. What's that? But if you want to just listen to this one again or watch this one again, I that. pity you. Actually, all of them are recorded, but this is a fresh one today because every one I do is different. But yeah. they're they're already on the website. All five lessons. Okay. Now I. I'm sorry I said that because you'll all stay home next week. <laughs> you know, but no, come and do it because it's fresh and there's new illustrations and new life going on each week. But they are recorded there. Uh, the one, this one will be ready in a couple, three days when media gets it up and posts it. And I think Ray and I were talking about that on the way in today. Okay, how do people find that? And I think it'll be on YouTube. So if you go on YouTube, like to find where the services are, mm -hmm. you should find, and somebody help me if you've done this, you go to YouTube, and you go to training center, and then you should find a line. Okay, that's where I would start. And if you can't find it, call here, ask for Tanya Newman to help because she's our admin upstairs. I've seen it under the resources tab on the app too. The to resources the, yeah. where you go to the resources on the, like on the yeah. Uh, if you go to training center, yeah, but, but I'm not the regular fellowship people. app, the regular fellowship website where you go under resources. Yeah, you can, you can yeah. get. Yeah, I think you can get it, but it won't be this one. Right, right, right. Won't be the fresh one. I think yeah. that's on YouTube. Gotcha. Like the services, I think exactly. the best we know right now. Great question, though. Anything else? Not raining, looks like so. Uh, Hey, uh, great attention. Thanks for being here. See you next week. Blessings and uh, nice to have you here. Thank you.